I'm not having connection issues today. Thank you for joining. How's everyone? The weather is so nice today. Too bad we cannot uh, get out, but um, regardless, it makes you feel good. Even if you just look out a window to see the bright sunny day. So awesome. So today we'll be drinking a oolong. Um, so I repeatedly said this, oolong is a giant category. You can have some of the lightest teas and then you can have some of the boldest teas. They can all be oolong. Today, the style of oolong that we'll be having is a oolong called Dan Chong, D-A-N-C-O-N-G. Sometimes I hear people pronounce this Dan Chong with the C as a K, but it's actually uh, pronounced, the C pronounces the S, so it's a Dan Chong. Um, and you uh, probably heard me saying that Dan Chong is actually not even the uh, accurate name for this category of the teas. It's really used to refer to a very specific a uh, great of this style of oolong back in the days when uh, tea making was a communal activity instead of uh, individual or private to each household. So, uh, but nowadays it almost becomes synonymous with it. But if you hear anybody's like, this is the actual dance home, so not like the dance home just for the category of the tea, you know what the person is talking about. Um, that's also sometimes, uh, to be more accurate, you can call it uh, Feng Huang Oolong or Phoenix Oolong. Uh, and it's because the Oolong comes from a mountain called the Phoenix Mountain. Uh, the varietal or the cultivar that we'll be having today is called Bai Ye. So that's the name of the tea. And we're going to open this up together because um, you might be wondering uh, how do you disband this. So you can grab a, a, a pair of scissors and just go uh, at this where the bound is and then the connection is. You can cut it open and it becomes a packet like this. And then what you can do is you can cut around it. And it open up with uh, almost like a little mouth and it can guide the tea uh, through. So we're just going to put the tea directly into the gaiwan. Uh, but if you have a piece of paper and you want to put it on a piece of paper to guide it into the gaiwan, you can do that as well. And it, make sure you have the water boiling. Uh, so as uh, always, because I cannot really see the uh, words when I'm doing the uh, light uh, session, so what we're going to do is uh, I'm just going to talk, and uh, uh, after I finish talking, I'll take the phone closer to my face, and I'll be able to see all the comments and questions. So please do ask questions then, and then uh, we can have uh, every all the questions answered then. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about varietal first. Uh, the reason being, uh, oolongs are more typically made with a single coat of art and not. So, uh, and we all know that the name of this coat of art is called Bai Ye. It is actually very, very common uh, sold as honey orchid or as uh, Mi Lan Xiang. So Mi Lan Xiang is the Chinese name for uh, the varietal honey orchid. I have actually never tasted a real Mi Lan Xiang here in the States. Every Mi Lan Xiang that's brought to me uh, has been an actual a Bai Ye. So Bai Ye is very pleasant varietal. It's probably the most popular cultivar of all uh, Phoenix Oolongs. It's very peachy, it's uh, uh, so bright, and has sweetness in the aroma. So a lot of people just think that this is uh, probably, uh, because of the, uh, the sweetness in the aroma, I uh, think that this is probably the famous honey orchid varietal that China also has, but it's actually a completely different varietal. Um, in China, uh, in rural China, oftentimes when people talk about the honey note, it's more emphasis on the aroma of the honey and also on the texture of the honey. So the real honey orchid um, uh, 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 varietal is actually quite waxy in its mouthfeel. It's very different from this uh, taste. Actually, a lot of top restaurants in New York City, when they sell uh, this tea, they also mistakenly sell sold it as honey orchid or the Milan Xiang. Uh, anyway, so now let's uh, start brewing this tea. 
Um, and you want to do this when your water is boiled. For oolong, it's very important with how to use boiling water, right? Um, so this guy one is actually called a seven gram guy one because we are uh, benchmarking on the uh, standard size of the oolong that goes into it. And given that this style of brewing was actually first invented for this style of oolong, so for Danzong, uh, so it's actually called the seven gram guy one. And it's seven grams of tea that goes into it. So we put it aside. Um, the rinsing of the tea or uh, not drinking the first brew, I should say, um, is also a tradition of the region. Uh, one of the very practical reasons is because oolongs are all tightly rolled and it is uh, best practice to uh, not serve your guests a uh, the first brew because by that point the tea hasn't really opened up yet and it's uh, a little bit too diluted to be served to the guest. So we're going to give it to the tea pet. Um, you do want to save a uh, uh, one cup, even though I just said you're not supposed to drink the first brew. Uh, it is because of a, let's just say it's an etiquette, right? And when you're uh, serving guests, you do not want to appear that you are stingy and that you uh, serve your guests a diluted brew. But it is a very good practice to drink the first brew if it is the first time for you to find out about a tea, right? So let me uh, just give the rest to the tea pet. Especially when we're exploring the tasting hierarchy where you have the aroma, the uh, actual taste, the body, texture, and then the aftertaste. The first brew, uh, if you compare the first brew and the second brew, it really helps to train our brain to be able to analyze what is goes into the aroma uh, compartment and then what goes into the taste compartment. The first brew is mostly the aroma. Mm. All right, so now let's brew the first brew. It's very peachy. So wrap it. It's important we keep our uh, brewing station clean. So if you see there is a uh, some of the uh, tea liquid goes onto the saucer. Feel free to develop a habit of always pour it out. Mm. Okay. So um, if oolong is a very big category that can have some of the lightest teas and darkest tea, then what makes a oolong oolong? Just as with any uh, category of teas, the tea categorization, obviously you can categorize teas many, many different ways. But in general, when we say the green tea, the yellow tea, white tea, oolong, red, black. Uh, so in this kind of categorization, the difference is the processing method. So long story short, if you process the tea into oolong, then it's an oolong tea. Now, um, uh, oolong processing uh, basically involves a uh, deliberate uh, shaking of the tea that you regulate the uh, fermentation of the tea that results in a partially fermented tea and that's what makes oolong so aromatic. There's no other category can be as aromatic as oolong. It's not even fair when we compare the aroma of oolong to the aroma of any other categories of teas. So usually, you know, if I say that this green tea is very showy, it's very aromatic, or this red tea is very showy, very aromatic, we're really talking talking about comparison within the context of this particular category. You cannot compare the aroma of a green tea to a oolong. It's very frequent. Um, so it, the, even the lightest oolong, you know, it still has very showy characteristic. It can be like a very sparkling kind of feeling to it. Um, this particular style of oolong is heavily fermented and mediumly roasted. All traditional oolongs are roasted, uh, and actually all traditional oolongs are usually roasted at least twice. Uh, and then depends on the specific cultivar, so it depends on a varietal of the oolong. You can uh, either um, roast it four, uh, three times or sometimes even four times because certain leaves are larger and uh, you need to roast it more frequently in order for the fire to completely uh, saturate it within the leaves. And also sometimes it depends on the weather as well. In very dry seasons, you do have to roast the tea for shorter time but more frequently. Um, and this is to prevent uh, over firing the tea. 
Now, oolong is also this category of tea. Oh, let's have the first brew first. All right. So if you uh, compare the first brew with the aroma of the tea, you immediately notice that this one has a little bit more substantiality on the palate, right? Um, again, it's more like the difference between something uh, that's more abstract in the taste um, realm versus something that's more uh, actual. It's like a reality of the taste. Now, uh, it, you also notice it has a little bit more tannins. Actually, Phoenix Oolong is known to be one of the most tannic uh, category of teas. Uh, this makes it an excellent, excellent uh, tea to pair with almost any food, especially greasy food. If you have rich dessert, it's very good for pairing, uh, for cheese, all those. Um, it basically works very similar to wine. It is also makes it to have uh, a lot of the aftertaste as well, so the taste is able to transform within uh, in your mouth. That, that kind of works with that, like that as well. All right. All right. So um, when you pick oolong, so oolong cannot be uh, made from buds. So when you pick oolong, you have to pick leaves only. And depends on the style of oolong you are making, uh, oolongs all pick from the tea leaves in the, the uh, technical term for that is called open face or tai mian, right? So it's basically talking about when a bud opens up and another bud opens up and another bud opens up and eventually you have no bud and you just have three leaves on the very top. And uh, the three leaves are all opened up and depends on how much the leaves open up, you can have a uh, more tender one. So you rank, rank them from small opening, medium opening to large opening. And then home picks about a uh, small to medium opening. So it's more tender in the oolong picking. You always want to pick a very long stem when you pick the oolong. This is to ensure your water supply during the making. So when oolong is first uh, picked, uh, harvested and if the weather allows you always want the tea to stay for a little bit in the uh, under the sunlight uh, to sun wilt for a little bit this can literally rank from uh, as little as 15 minutes to as long as a few hours it really depends on how strong the sun is in tea making we always say you have to look at the tea to make the tea you never want to make a decision for the tea you have to wait for the tea to tell you if the tea is ready or not so uh, once that step is done, we take the tea inside and let the tea to continue to sit. A typical timeline, um, I'm just, I'm making it up, but also at the same time, it's kind of the general timeline if you want to plan your day during the tea making. Uh, let's just say you want to do this until about right after uh, dinner time. And then after dinner time, you will start to shake the tea. At the very beginning, you want to be very, very gentle with the tea. When I say shaking the tea, you're really just flipping the tea a little bit because there's still a lot of moisture in the tea and you do not want to get the enzymes to be too excited. This process is called water traveling. So we're really just managing how the water leaves the tea. Um, you want to do this very frequently. It depends on the style of oolong. Again, uh, this can be either you do it uh, every 45 minutes and you do it seven times a night, or you do it every two hours. You only do it four to five times an evening. So it really depends on the style of the oolong that you do. Because remember, this is a mean to end. The end is a desired fermentation level of the tea. And even that does not have a uh, like a standard around it because it depends on the variety that you're making, it can vary a lot. And also the, the weather while you're making the tea. So for Phoenix Oolong, because the tea is very tender, so we do usually want the tea to sit longer and then you want to touch the tea a little bit less, especially at the beginning. All right, uh, so now let's uh, either finish this brew or you can pour the tea onto a separate container. Uh, to enjoy the tea later. And then we're going to do the next brew. So this is the second brew. Remember, we don't count the rinse. Grab and pour. Make sure you pour around the rim. Remember, no sound, quiet movements, right? As quiet as possible. Make sure you drain all the tea out. Phoenix Oolong does have a higher tendency to get bitter. 
So uh, it's very important to make sure you drain the tea completely, otherwise it can be very astringent. Now let's try this brew. Mm -hmm. See the tea has opened up even more. So you're really getting to know even more about this tea. So even truer taste of the tea start to come out, right? Um, you definitely feel the, the, the tannins are well distributed in your mouth and that facility even stronger aftertaste uh, as a result as well. The aroma starts to uh, fade back to the background instead of something that you notice immediately. And even though there's a lot of sweetness in the aroma, but remember this is an, not an actual sweet tea. So um, a lot of them are the sweet feelings and you do have a kind of sweet aftertaste from this tea as well. All right, so let's continue with talking about the processing of this tea. So uh, after you uh, uh, turn the tea or flip the tea, uh, towards the end of the shaking, and this can be done with the uh, little uh, barrel machine as well nowadays. Actually, the machine has been introduced to oolong making uh, even a long time ago. So if you go to any of the tea museum uh, to uh, either mainland China or to Taiwan, you notice that people have these machines even as uh, early as the end of Qing Dynasty, even though these are the machines that you still need to power by hand, but it does take uh, a lot of the labor uh, work away uh, from making tea because this is a very important step because at the end, you kind of want to shake the tea very vigorously and sometimes even over a hundred times and it's very difficult to do that on the tea tray. So uh, as you're doing this, what happens is you're actually, the that's long stamp that you have capped for making the oolong, it'll act almost like a water reservoir and it'll carry water to the leaves and this will help to maintain the uh, moisture level that is needed for the enzyme to maintain a certain level of activity. But also at the same time, uh, it carries certain nutrients that was that's only in the stem but not in the uh, leaves before as well. So it increased the complexity during the making. Um, and when we're doing this as a result, once the tea is perfectly fermented, you're going to see a red edge around the tea leaves. Now, this red edge can uh, be a lot or very little, depends on the style of oolong that you're making. Um, sometimes we just say it's like about 30% red and 70% uh, green, but it's very difficult to tell just by visual. And also there are certain varietals that have the less tendency to go to have a red edge, but those will be exceptions. Most of the teas will develop an edge, uh, a red edge. Um, and uh, for the last round, after you have the red edge and the tea has achieved the certain fermentation level, you can let the tea sit for another uh, two to three hours. And keep in mind, this is already like 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, and then uh, the tea maker gets to take a very short nap for a couple hours. And about, it depends, really depends on how uh, well you your tea was before you go to bed. Uh, you can get up either at 6, 6.30 or 7 a.m. And that's the kill grain step to happen. Remember, kill grain is basically you apply very high heat to the tea leaves and this destroy all the enzymes in the tea and therefore freeze the tea at that stage you want. So we freeze the tea at the optimal fermentation level that we want. And when there's still uh, 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 heat and uh, moisture with the tea, so basically the tea is more malleable, you want to roll the tea uh, to achieve the strength shape that we have saw in the uh, dry leaves. And um, then after that, you uh, need to break up any clumps and then you uh, spread the tea onto a tray and then we're gonna bake the tea dry. Uh, this is usually done at least twice to ensure thorough baking. It's very much like a cooking a large uh, piece of uh, uh, material during you know cooking, no matter what you're cooking, either potatoes or, or steaks. Uh, so you cannot just apply high heat uh, all the way because you're gonna have uneven um, uh, done this on the outside to the inside. So same thing with baking tea. Always picturing tea is a 3D object. It's not two-dimensional, right? So you have to uh, slowly apply the heat to make sure that the inside and outside both uh, are dry. And this is just the baking step. And after the baking is done, the more tedious steps start to happen. But let's uh, take a, a moment to brew the next brew of the tea and then I'll continue.
All right, so you can either pour it to the side. I keep it in the cup that I'm going to drink all the tea later. But um, if you you know are not like me, you've been talking this whole time, you're probably sipping on the tea. And if you have uh, luckily have somebody who lives with you and enjoy the tea with you, then that's even better, right? Okay. Make sure we have boiling water. Get around. So this now is the third group, right? Yeah. All right. So feel free to smell the lid. Mm. Do you guys smell like some of the oozy smell? Yeah. So this oozy smell is uh, very highly sought after in uh, teas with a little bit older age. So this one is not like super, super old. It's just a couple of decades old, but still because of the very nice terroir, it actually, the oozy note already starts to come out. And this definitely gives the tea a sense of complexity, but also depth. Um, and when we're tasting the tea, also notice in the aftertaste, as we brew this aftertaste will come out uh, particularly stronger. Uh, if you uh, drink Irish whiskey, uh, the aftertaste is actually very similar to uh, the Red Breast 21. So it's a pot still whiskey. It has a, a very golden yuki note. Oh, we got disconnected for a moment. So I was just saying like, if you don't know what a salty duck egg yuki is like, it's also kind of very similar to like a, a golden uh, apple note as well. Uh, for the even better uh, baia, this note will come out, come through even more. All right, so, uh, now, uh, after you have already baked the tea, uh, in the region, people actually spend all summer sorting the tea. Because remember, when you're picking the tea, you're picking the long stem. And sometimes uh, with the long stem, you also have uh, tea leaves that's too mature to really be made into the final tea that we want. So what happens is that people will then need to spend the time to, to sort these out. So it's literally called picking out the stems and the yellow leaves because the finished tea, tea uh, the more mature leaves because it has less compounds to uh, be able to convert it to the, to the ideal color and the taste that we want, it'll usually appear a little bit lighter than the rest of the teas. So we call them the yellow leaves. So we need to pick them out and it literally takes months. Every single piece of tea needs to go through this head sorting. After this is done, then the roasting season starts. Uh, Phoenix oil, because it's very tender, each time when we roast the tea, and it's all roasted by charcoal ash, by the way, and also it takes about 24 hours to burn a pit. So you have to burn a pit for 24 hours to have it completely reduced to nothing but the ash. And then this ash is so packed with heat that you can uh, rely on it for, uh, depends on how well you made the pit, it can go from 12 to 15 days. Uh, sometimes people even brag about how their pit can last for even 17 days. It's a really, really long time for the ash to maintain the heat. Um, and then you put the tea on a bamboo tray and then bake it over the, uh, the charcoal ash. Um, for tender leaves like Phoenix Oolong, every time you roast it, it takes about six to eight hours. You do not want to roast it for too long, otherwise you're uh, gonna reach again the uneven roasting. And then you have to take the tea down and the tea needs to rest for three weeks. So this is why the roasting season is so long for oolong. And uh, after the three um, weeks, then you can roast it again. So oftentimes when we see a hurried roasting is when people do not, uh, uh, adopt the, the the waiting the waiting period for making the tea. So it's very hurried roasting, right? And uh, you can roast it for like seven uh, to nine to ten hours at a time, and then you didn't wait, and then the tea is uh, tastes very roasted, and you just kind of output the tea. But for best practice, you always wanted to roast it to uh, not super long time, but then you have to wait and then roast it again. So traditional oolongs are all roasted at least twice. And then you need to uh, uh, do this again. And then after only after three weeks of resting, the tea is able to be drank as well. And also along the way, every time we do this, you're sorting the tea again. So it's a very, very tedious process. Okay. Do you all try the third brew? Do you guys feel the, the uh, apple-y aftertaste I was talking about? 
it has a golden feeling to it. Like it's not a color. It's just like this taste in your mouth feels very golden, right? Um, so that's why a uh, the best telltale of uh, when if an oolong comes from the traditional tea region or not is actually by the time when it comes out. So for this oolong, even though the region is a little bit warmer than some of the other tea regions, it's uh, considered the earliest oolong to be harvested. Still, uh, the final tea does not come out until uh, early fall, just because of this long sorting period and also the roasting period as well, right? Uh, and Baia is actually a varietal that you do harvest very early on, so it's considered a uh, varietal that you can enjoy early on. It's also in abundance. That's why it's so popular as well. All right, so let's uh, finish or dump the uh, third brew. We can save it in a separate cup, and then we're going to do the next one. Uh, I'm waiting for my water to boil, so let's spend a little time to talk about the location of Phoenix Oolong. So Phoenix Oolong come from this mountain uh, ranch called Phoenix Mountain, Feng Huang Shan. That's why, hence the name Phoenix Oolong. Now Phoenix Mountain actually ha is a pretty big area and has many different villages. Uh, this particular Oolong come from a village called uh, Feng Xi, which is a jurisdiction village. Now, there are actually two villages in Phoenix Mountain called Feng Xi. Uh, it's, uh, the, sh the word Xi for these two villages are two different Chinese characters. So for Chinese person, if you see them in written form, it's not confusing. But you can imagine how confusing it is if you're just verbally mentioning about Feng Xi, right? So, um, uh, this Feng Xi is, is the one with the word for creek or spring. It's really referring to uh, a reservoir in the region called uh, the Feng Xi Reservoir, right? Um, so if you ever go to Phoenix Mountain, you will not miss this reservoir. It's, uh, uh, it's kind of like a local tourist attraction as well and people fishing there and stuff like that. Uh, this one comes from a natural village in this jurisdiction village called Da Ping, uh, which is a uh, a pretty popular area because it's uh, uh, the price is good and it's still one of the best locations for the tea as well and the production is pretty good as well. All right, so let's brew the fourth brew. Go around, cover. Don't forget the strainer. Brush open, grab, and pour gently around. Right. I hope everyone's uh, brewing is also uh, got a lot of practice and it's uh, been continuously improving. Always develop a habit of uh, smelling the lid, um, especially for oolong. From the first brew to now, you should have noticed a big difference in the aroma that lingers on the on the lid. Now, for Phoenix oolong, even though the tovar is not super refined, but there is a one uh, top top tovar, so you can consider that the ground crew of all Phoenix Mountain, which is a village called Udong. Um, now, Udon actually has many different natural villages as well, uh, and in these natural villages, they each um, have a certain uh, tea tr sp style of tea tree that's kind of older than uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the, the big village have. So that's why they're kind of each known for different kind of teas. Uh, and Tea Drunk, if you go to our website, if you really like this tea, you can uh, get yourself a different one that comes from Udong. It comes from uh, one of my favorite villages of Udong called Zhong Xin uh, it's, it's In a way, it's not as aromatic, but it's so clean and pristine and this, you know, the, all the characteristics you're looking for in a high, high elevation uh, tea. And mostly importantly, it's a very cold area. And also the aftertaste just seems to linger forever. Um, it's also come from older trees, so that mossy, woodsy note is even uh, uh, more prominent as well. Right, so now let's try this fourth brew. Hmm, 
I would say this fourth fruit is super flavorful. It's very full. So not only that he has a little bit more tannin, so that uh, is more abundance in the terms of his complexity and the transformation into aftertaste. But also, it is just also fuller, right? It seems like the whole texture is a bit of rounder as well with this brew. And it has a little bit of more sweetness. It's a simultaneously the sweetness that, that's uh, more abstract, like the almost like an aftertaste kind of sweetness, but also has a little bit of an actual sweetness as well. And it still has some aroma, especially if you, after you swallow the tea and you breathe the note out of your mouth like, like that, right? All right, so that basically covers the basics. Uh, remember the three factors of any tea and always uh, uh, use that as your guideline to dig into the tea deeper. Uh, deeper. And then the, uh, the more specific questions you can ask about these, the better. So it's the location, right, the varietal. So everything about where the tea comes from, everything about what, what about this particular tea tree or tea trees, and uh, how did you make the tea, the processing? So we have gone through these three about this tea and now I'm going to take a moment to bring the camera closer to me and then we can uh, go over some questions, all right? Uh, I'm gonna try this today to see if it works. All right, um, I'm going to first check the questions that's in the, uh, the question mark one. So you can also type questions as well. Uh, does the difference in tenderness of the leaves from a same tree or branch give a different taste, uh, develop the brew different, uh, it got cut off after that. So, uh, yes, uh, I don't know what happened to my screen. Uh, yes, so the tenderness, of course, it has a, a big impact because uh, different levels of tenderness, uh, depend. Uh, it, really um, determines the uh, abundance and the complexity. So both the quantity and the quality of the uh, compounds in the tea leaves and also the moisture level, which is very important. Um, okay, I don't know how I'm able to uh, go back to the, oh my God, this is so frustrating. What temperature water should I use to brew tea guanyin? You also want to use boiling, especially tea guanyin actually use even more mature tea leaves. It's very important that you use uh, boiling water to brew tea guanyin. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to uh, bring out the full taste of the tea. Are the oolongs that are on the greener side, are they also roasted? So those would be the new style of oolong, which only came around uh, in the very recent uh, two decades. And those are the, oh, three decades now, sorry. I'm like completely forgot that we're already in 2020. Uh, so the, uh, those are the, the new style, which the tea is uh, uh, fermented in a controlled environment. It's also fermented much lighter to make the tea more aromatic. Uh, the, it does compromise on the texture a little bit. Uh, and also if you don't roast the tea, it helps to maintain that very fresh taste you want in the tea as well. Um, I'm having problem going back to the to the screen I was in. I'm only seeing half screen now, so I can't see the questions that are being typed. Uh, I'm just going to uh, pretend I'm sending something. Uh, okay. Uh, damn. I don't know how this works. Oh, ooh, sorry. All right. Um, I cannot see the questions that being uh, that was in the in the question part. I don't know what happened. Sorry. I'm having this. Uh, technical day. Oh, it's back on. Sorry. All right. Let me uh, go to the question again. Uh, Oolong tea comes from Taiwan. Can you say it is uh, Taiwan's tea guan yin? Oh, so that's the, so, so it's, we have to clarify this question, right? So um, if a, uh, so there are two, uh, well, now there are three main uh, style of oolong that uh, Taiwan makes, right? Right. One is, uh, um, uh, you can consider it's the development based on the uh, uh, wee oolong, so the cliff tea, and it takes on the string shape, and it goes from northern Fujian province to nor northern Taiwan, and that's the baozhong, right? And then we can see this trend as it goes to Taiwan, it starts to become lighter uh, fermented and also start to not being roasted again. And then you can also have... Um, 
uh, the uh, the uh, Sai of Oolong that comes from southern Fujian to southern Taiwan, and that's in the uh, uh, the Nantou area, and that's the more typical Taiwanese Oolong that you usually see, which takes a half ball shape. That is not to be uh, mistaken to just be as Tie Guan Yin, because Tie Guan Yin not only is referring so to the style of tea making, so yes, in a way it is done in the Tie Guan Yin style, but if you're talking about tea that comes from Taiwan, it also needs to be made from from the variety or the cultivar called Tiguanyin in order for that particular uh, Tiguanyin style of oolong made in Taiwan to be called Tiguanyin. I hope that makes sense because otherwise it'll be named after uh, other cultivars or because it's a newer tea region so what happens is people also take the liberty to uh, just kind of name the tea however they want to name the tea and some of them are named after location as well or sometimes people just uh, you know each producer will give their tea a specific product name instead of uh, uh, going with some of the more conservative naming conventions and uh, of course in the uh, the the east side of uh, sorry the west side of Taiwan they also have a different kind of oolong but it's actually more like a white tea it's not really uh, a very strict oolong processing uh, and that's the Oriental Beauty right and let's see the next one. Uh, my screen is a little frozen, but for oolong, uh, let me see the next question. If a tea package only says Phoenix oolong, I should ask more information. Uh, yes, if a tea, um, it's basically you know how you can have wine, right? And the, the um, if a wine only says red wine, which uh, sometimes it happens, then you kind of know it's probably not something. Uh, very impressive. But if you're in a culture where people have never had wine before, uh, and then red wine, people probably feel like, oh, this is already a lot of information, but it's actually not much information at all. So same thing for a, a Chinese person, you know, if a tea is only called the Phoenix Oolong without further specifying the location, the varietal, uh, the vintage, and it's, it's a little awkward. Yeah. So you do want to dig deeper, but sometimes it's also because it's, um, it's, it, it does not have any deeper information, which is fine. So just like, you know, you just want to know that are you pay paying the price for a table wine or are you paying the price for like a Grand Cru uh, Burgundy, right? So also for the tea, just every tea has a price. It is not the tea's fault, right? So if the tea uh, just says Phoenix Oolong and you like the tea and you're paying a fair price for it, I don't see anything wrong with that. I trouble brewing the bai, you end up with too much water in the gaiwan, or there should be water left in the gaiwan. Okay. Uh, no, there should not be any water left in the gaiwan after you uh, brew the but yeah, just make sure you drain the liquid out completely. It's very important, especially for Phoenix Oolong, just because it is a uh, a tea that has a tendency to get bitter. So uh, when we do the brewing class, uh, uh, doing the virtual brewing class, I specifically select the tea that I feel uh, it can give people uh, um uh, like people would not mess it up too much at home, but when we brew it here uh, at Tea Drunk, we have the in-person tea class. Remember, I always pick the Phoenix Oolong because I do want people to drive point, drive home the point that certain teas are very, very sensitive to uh, just even a millisecond of time difference. So you want to be able to to manage that. So today's tea is the hardest to brew. So if you feel that you haven't done it very right, uh, do not feel defeated. You know, even for a season, the tea brewer, this is the tea that's easiest to mess up. Uh, and of course, remember the the go around, the uh, the the go around is to uh, either lower the temperature uh, or dilute the tea, right? So use more water, less tea, or lower temperature. Between the two, I will probably recommend uh, the higher water to tea ratio. Uh, which then means you have to find a different vessel for that, or you just use less tea, right? Uh, instead of lower the temperature, just because lowering the temperature really uh, does not do good tea justice. Some of the uh, more sophisticated notes would not come out with the lower temperature. For oolong, which leaves are used and why? Um, so oolongs, uh, I was assume this question is asking about what are the cultivars that we use to make oolong. Uh, so 
uh, like theoretically, you can use any cultivar to make any tea, right? Because uh, it's all how you make the tea de uh, determines the 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 style of the tea. Um, but due to you know certain historic and geographic reasons, regions uh, reasons certain region will only have uh, certain cultivars. Uh, typically, we see uh, trunk style, medium leaf varietal for ulo more often, but it does, it's not always true though. Uh, and it was getting given uh, ulo region. Um, um, there are probably over a hundred uh, different cultivars uh, being used. Even though the most common, uh, Phoenix Udon has a more diverse of common cultivars. I would say it's probably at least a dozen very common ones. Uh, in Wuyi Mountain, if you're in the True Cliff region, it's mostly the Rogue and Shui Xian varietal. But if you count all the surrounding regions as well, it's also about a dozen that's very popular. A few steeps in, I got an orange aroma, not the apple. Oh, <laughs> it's also, you know, orange or apple. Actually, the locals would call what we call the peachy note, the apple note. And without me saying anything, when I serve the tea to a lot of our customers, people will actually mention notes like lychee. I think it's really about what, you know, like what, what hits you, right? What helped you to remember a particular uh, note. So that's why I always say it's never for tea drinking. It's never a note writing contest. It's about what makes sense to you. It doesn't matter what name you put on the uh, the tea if it's for your own purpose. Unless you want to communicate with people, so then you want to establish a language that's easy to communicate. However, if you just want to, um, you know, better your own tasting ability, it's more about even if you don't have any name for the note, but if you have this the tea among a hundred teas, can you still identify this tea? Whatever make you remember the taste, that's even more important. How do you clean your teaware? You use teaware water? Do you, uh, so because these are all porcelain or glasses, you do want to wash them really well. If you have unglazed teaware, uh, depends on whether or not you want it to be clean or you want it to be seasoned, then you can either uh, rinse it with hot water, like boiling water, and leave it be, or you can also rub it. But for porcelain and the glasses, uh, it's a very high density. You do want to clean it. You, uh, I usually don't use soap because tea doesn't have grease anyway I just rub it really well let me go see the typed question again are there any books you might recommend about tea culture in China today um, yes uh, I would not recommend I don't to be honest I don't really have any English books to recommend uh, but there are some Chinese books to recommend uh, for tea culture actually somebody just emailed us the other day too I would just go ahead and give these three books uh, for tea history there's like this great great tea scholar in China uh, not from long ago but he's no longer with us anymore um, and his name is Chen Chuan and he wrote a uh, book uh, can be translated to the general history of tea Cha Ye Tong Shi I would highly recommend that book. Uh, I mean, since then, scholars have offered, uh, obviously, different opinions about it, which is a good thing. But I think it still gives you a very uh, good structural overview of the history of the tea. And they touch on many, many different aspects. Um, for tea culture, I would recommend one by uh, Professor Ding Yishou. He wrote a book called the Zhonghua Cha Wenhua. Uh, so that's the one that's specifically about the cultural aspect of tea. Uh, if you want to uh, know more about the tea biochemistry, uh, there's a book that uh, all the undergrads of tea studies in China, they, they, they had to uh, uh, take a class, which is the tea biochemistry class. And the book is also called Tea Biochemistry. It's essentially a textbook, and it's written by uh, Professor Wan Xiaojun. Uh, so these are the ones that I would recommend, but only if you read Chinese. None of these are actually uh, translated into English. Uh, are Phoenix Oolong only from Guangdong province? Uh, well, this is really a question about is champagne only coming from champagne? So if you're talking about a uh, Phoenix Oolong uh, that bears the endorsement of the uh, Tuar, then yes, it needs to be only come from not only Guangdong province, but the Phoenix Mountain area. But if you're talking about uh, this style of tea, are other people able to make this style of tea? Yes, of course they are able to. Uh, are frequent Xiang mean 
named Danchong varietals or just names. Ya Shi Xiang, Mi Lan Xiang. Um, so this really has. So this is a very complicated concept. Uh, I'm very glad somebody asked. Uh, so I'll try my best to answer it here. But on our website, under the section Learn and Tea Fundamentals, if you find the Phoenix Oolong area, there's a whole write up to explain this concept. So basically, you can um, either name the tea after the varietals, or you can name the tea after the fragrance it has. And there had been effort to try to uh, stabilize the naming convention and try to uh, lump all the teas into fragrance, but that was not successful. So what now it left us with even greater mess, right? So you can basically say Mi Lan Xiang, the it's referring to either a, a specific kind of aroma, which can be uh, used to summarize a several different kind of tea uh, cultivars, or it's referring to one specific kind of cultivar. And right now, if it's named after the cultivar, it's considered one upper hand. So uh, it's basically just because the cultivar usually worth more. Yeah, and then you can use a lesser uh, price cultivar to to make a tea try to achieve similar aroma or similar fragrance. Uh, and Yashixiang right now is referring to just Yashixiang deduction. Uh, but just like you know, in any case, a lot of the uh, Yashixiang are actually not made from the cultivar Yashixiang though. All right. Uh, next question. Drinking technique, my friend from Nanjing says to inhale hair as well. So you want to slurp the tea a little bit to introduce some hair into uh, uh, your your drinking. This will help to open up your uh, uh, sensories, but you do not want to uh, you do not want to over slurp. That will defeat the purpose. So you can uh, experiment a little bit by taking a sip of the tea and then swashing your mouth like how you do with a mouthwash. And you notice the tea becomes a little bit more tannic, and this defeats the purpose of our goal to uh, fully know the characteristics of the tea. Because now you basically, uh, you know, if, if you know if our like pattern everything is a computer, you now just design everything to have a secure data. So that's not what you want. And but you do want to, uh, so you want to fully utilize your senses, but you do not want to uh, overdo one aspect of it. So you only taste one aspect of the tea. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that that's awesome. You know, I love doing this, and I can't say enough how how much a blessing it had been for me to be able to uh, you know c remain connected with all the tea lovers and you know have something to look forward to every day. And it's just yeah, it's just so so amazing. I always know that tea connects people, and then you know, enjoyed having uh, face to face uh, sharing of tea with people. But I, I just never thought this is going to be this much fun as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Should we always use all the tea from a pack when brewing? Uh, yes. So for uh, the at least for tea drops tea, and then I would say for uh, all the Chinese brands, yes, you always want to use a full package because that's what uh, people will have packed the tea into. It's the standard brewing size. So uh, and usually it goes with even though the five gram guy ones, seven gram guy one, ten gram guy ones are all very popular, but the seven gram guy ones still maintain the most popular. So usually that's the standard brewing size that goes into the guy one, which is uh, five grams for red tea. Uh, 7 grams for Danchong, 8 grams for uh, Teguanyin, uh, Yancha, and 7 grams for raw pu'er as well. Is there any usage of old brood tea leaves? Um, so yeah, so tea drunk we compost our leaves also because we just have a lot of spent leaves. Um, and you can do however you want. I mean, you can even put some hot water with the tea leaves, soak your feet into it. Uh, my monk friend in China, he does that and supposed to help you sleep and things like that. So, so you can do many different ways with the spent tea leaves. But if you don't want to just uh, uh, dump it, the composting it definitely is a very, very good ending to these tea leaves. All right, now let me go back to the. Um, uh, the other questions, uh, how do you clean your teaware and Kung Fu Tea Fist? Sure. <laughs> uh, 
Oh wow. Uh, what is your favorite type of tea and why? Um, I think I answered this question before, and it's not um, for me. You know, the the fav I do have favorite teas, but the favorite teas usually is it really has to do with uh, what I feel the tea has broke through certain things. Um, uh, if you go back to the uh, the three oolong tasting I did before, the, like the old oolong overview, I talked a little bit about how much I love the uh, that rogue from um, uh, Hui Kung from last year. So it's usually very specific tea, and it's mostly because there's something about the processing of the tea that impressed me. Um, and usually, mm, in a way, to our impress me less and less um but often but some, once in a while i will encounter a tea that just like it just shows the tour so so well um but just because it's become a default setting you know like a lot of teas i drink they they already come from the top location and um i mean varietal wise i already selected the ones i wanted so that's you know the human factor is already in place and so it's usually the processing that has some kind of breakthrough that really really impressed me uh, who are your two professionals? Uh, well, I will sometimes read some uh, articles. So I don't have a uh, any person sort of say. Uh, so I do not know how to answer that question. Who are your tea professionals? Who do you follow in the tea world? That was the question. Yeah, I think we all follow each other. Um. Slightly unrelated, but what is the most tannic yan cha? Uh, the more tannic yan cha usually, well, tannic has a lot to do with how you make the tea as well. And I would say, uh, uh, if you ferment the tea uh, to a certain level, usually on the lighter side, and the tea becomes a little bit more tannic. Also, when you roast the tea, if the tea does not receive enough roast, it tends to be more tannic as well. Um, and also certain varietal, which which kind of also dictates how you make the tea, because there are certain varietal you always want to make it certain way. Uh, so in general, it's actually the tea that's more aromatic that usually tends to be more tannic. It's just because the body and the aroma usually are hard to balance out. And then for the tea that comes from either more inferior location or the teas that actually come from... Um, uh, the uh, what is it called? Either more inferior location or the tea comes from the uh, um, uh, uh, certain cultivars that's uh, just we want to bring out aroma more than anything else. Those are usually the more tannic teas. A certain tea pair better with different pie, uh, types of food. Yes, absolutely. The, uh, like tea and food pairing uh, is not a something I would say that's been traditionally explored uh, in depth in China. However, um, given tea uh, with such a dynamic uh, uh, taste range and also uh, tea with tannins, uh, it definitely pairs very well with different types of food. And we are still kind of exploring and. And I wish one day, um, you know, we can have uh, a some system that can be uh, repeatedly applied uh, for everyday uh, consumption or everyday pairing of tea and food. Um, but a lot of the details are still needs to be uh, tested out. Uh, at Tea Drunk, we have done tea and chocolate pairing, uh, tea and uh, chef pre prepared food. Um, pairing so every time it's a little bit different we have done tea and cheese pairing tea and cheese are awesome together i just had to uh highly endorse this one um because cheese not only you know tea has tannins and it has a lot of the similar benefits you receive from wine uh and the uh the fat and the creaminess of the cheese um so tea can achieve the similar benefits but also uh tea is warm right so it it melts cheese and everything is just gets so much amplified in your mouth it's really amazing i would highly recommend people exploring tea and cheese um, and then for Phoenix Oolong that we had today, it really make anything fruity even fruitier. So if you have a, a some kind of dessert that you're not sure is a very fruity dessert and you have it with Phoenix Oolong, that fruity note will come out so much more. Oh, so I think that, uh, so if you really look at how Chinese tea is made, uh, oxidation is a very, uh, 
it's it's a term that's really not very accurate to describe what happens the complicated um uh, chemical exchanges that happens within tea. Um, so I think this is a very uh, good, maybe like a home uh, kind of research everyone can do as well, is if you uh, look at how Chinese teas are made, like traditional Chinese tea are made, and look at uh, some literature about how tea is made in general. If you compare that, you notice, yes, tea does go through oxidation. But if a tea only goes through oxidation but not going through fermentation, then it's usually not a very sophisticated tea. Um, um, so a lot of the enzymes in tea are oxidative enzymes. If we really have to be accurate, we can say that this is a oxidative enzyme facilitated metabolism. It's an enzymatic metabolism, but obviously it's very, very wordy. So neither fermentation nor oxidation comprehensively describe the very complicated metabolism that happens in tea. But uh, fermentation is a little bit more comprehensive than oxidation. Uh, you should do a tea and cheese pairing. Yes, <laughs> but I'm afraid I'll make everybody so jealous uh, in front of the screen because <laughs> if we cannot do this together, then it's kind of feels almost like a little show off. Uh, what kind of tea would you recommend with a cheese pairing uh, experience? Uh, some of the very tannic teas like uh, uh, raw puer or phoenix Uno are very good and some green teas are very good as well. Um, the one that really stood out to me, I remember we did Malfum, which is a tea with a little bit like a hairy note, but it's very savory uh, as well and we pair that with a um, uh, a goat cheese and it was so nice. Uh, it was like that, that goat, that, that, um, zesty kind of, uh, uh, savoriness of a goat cheese really comes through. Uh, what do you think about mixing different teas in a same brew? Um, I think mixing different teas in the same brew is very interesting to experiment. Um, but, uh, it really depends on like what your what your goal is, right? Um, so it's very similar to do you want to mix uh, red wine and white wine together? Uh, in a way, I would say why, why not, right? Yeah, you, if you want to, if you're just curious, you should always let your curiosity be satisfied, especially in these harmless ways. However, um, if you have a really really good rare bottle of white wine and the really good rare bottle of white red wine why would you do that um i think it kind of so sometimes we drink a tea because we want to uh, fully engage in the potential of the tea leaves, which is also the tea maker's vision for this tea. And that's basically, uh, you know, that's the very uh, essence of the art form of the tea is that this is a, we're experiencing the performance of this tea. Um, so trying to interfere with that kind of defeats the purpose. So it really depends on the, the objectives of why we're drinking certain tea. Um, but yeah, why not? I have, I have done it. You know, I have uh, tried to mix different teas together just because I want to see, you know, if I mix multiple teas together, uh, who will stand out more? You know, you always want to satisfy your curiosity, but also know that um, it does not serve the purpose to fully experience a single tea uh, you know, the, the single tea's performance, basically. But she's in green tea. So, um, have a specific tea for cocktail, black tea or oolong? Uh, it really depends on how, uh, like what kind of cocktail you make, right? Um, so far, I have done a pretty successful cocktail with a very highly, highly concentrated uh, cold brew gua pian, which is a very umami, grassy uh, Chinese green tea and especially cold brew it, the umaminess comes through so much more and also the floral note. So I cold brew that and I did it, um, uh, I mixed it with gin and a tiny bit of a very, very high quality sugar. Oh my God, it was so amazing. Uh, and I have to confess, last night I made a cocktail as well. Um, I had a very concentrated brew of qilan. So I uh, uh, mixed qilan with a um, uh, uh, some uh, Irish whiskey and um, uh, so I tried to like make a, a, a Chilean whiskey sour, a little lemon juice and maple syrup. Um, yeah, so that was that was good. I would 
uh, I guess it could be better, but it was pretty good. And uh, I'll probably make something again tonight as well. Yeah, and then uh, somebody mentioned about the Lapsan Sutron, so which is a smoked red tea. And because of the smokiness, it is very, uh, very much favored for mixing in for cocktail. Uh, so we only have a 50 seconds main, remain, and I cannot bring back that. Uh, um, uh, I cannot bring back that uh, question box again. So I'm sorry if anybody typed in more questions in that. Uh, if you can, please uh, uh, like comment here, and I'll try to fit it in. What does the number say mean to us poor? Oh, those means those are all factory poor. So those are factory f uh, formulas. So it's like, uh, you know, if you visit a uh, Yellowtail or uh, Budweiser, they will probably have certain formulas for uh, their mass produced uh, beer or wine. All right. Um, okay, thank you so much, everyone. We're about to just get cut off because we have reached our time limit.